Good evening. This is night nine of Psalms and Wisdom Bible Study. Uh, this is our last night together. Uh, so if you've gone through this whole study with us, uh, we're glad you were here either in person with us on Zoom or if you've watched it later on YouTube. Um, you've gone through five weeks of Psalms and now this is our fourth and final week on the wisdom literature. Now, interestingly enough, the way it worked out on the calendar, um, if you're watching this uh, sometime this week, you're actually going to get a sermon on Job, which is the one piece of wisdom literature we didn't do, but that's what I'm preaching Sunday. So we're actually covering all the wisdom literature um, now. So uh, once we go over Song of Songs tonight, which is what we're going to be looking at, um, you'll have looked at basically most of the wisdom literature. So uh, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, and Job. So uh, that's kind of, that was kind of cool. I didn't really realize that until I was preparing. I wrote sermon today and was like, huh, I forgot that we were doing Job right at the end of this. So that's great. Well, I've covered all of it if you take this class. So, so a couple of things. Um, we talked um, when we started this study, especially the wisdom part, we looked at things that were very much uh, optimistic, right? If you do good, you're going to get some good. If you do bad things, you get bad things. But if you'll do good things, good things will happen. Kind of a very optimistic view. And then last week, we studied Ecclesiastes. And I think it was uh, Doug Fry. But yeah, you just, you just made your eyebrows go up and down. I saw that. Um, but this is really pessimistic. Yes, it was. You can do all the right things and still not get it right. I mean, it's, it's a, it was a tough book. Um, it's not the most. Is not the most fun, but interestingly, it's probably the one of the most famous wisdom texts because of the a time to mend and a time to heal. By the way, if you're watching any of the presidential politics, um, uh, President-elect Biden actually quoted that at his acceptance speech the other night. Um, so whatever you think about all of that stuff, it was interesting because he started quoting it. And I was like, hey, we just studied that a week ago. I heard that text recently. So just some things for you to, to think about. Those are very famously quoted words. And then there's Song of Songs. Now, I'm not going to sit here on this Zoom call, or if you're watching it on YouTube later, and try to tell you that I fully understand Song of Songs. <laughs> um, I'm just going to lay it out up front that I'm going to work with some interpretations of this book. Um, it needs a rating. Like I almost <laughs> feel like on, on YouTube, when I, uh, when I fill out the YouTube form to push, put it on YouTube, you actually have to say, is this for kids or not? Normally I just put yes, man. I'm just, I'm like, Hmm, this is a crazy book. So as we study it, Please understand that scholars have debated this one more so than any others about, you know, if this book is written by Solomon, it seems like maybe this is a young Solomon. You know, like we talked about maybe Ecclesiastes is old man Solomon. Well, this one may be more younger Solomon. Okay. And if it's not Solomon, it's certainly um, a prosperous time when things are good. You can interpret that however you will. But it's clearly got some, some of that kind of stuff going on in it. But it's, it, it's different in that it doesn't follow any good patterns. You know, you, you know, most of the stuff we've been able to follow, you know, sort of lines. We've drawn lines and we've been able to go, okay, here's how that works and that works. Some of the songs are things differently. So I'm going to share my screen. And we're going to go through this um, as best we can and see where we get to. Oops, there we go. All right. So, Song of Songs. Um, just so you understand the title, sometimes it's called Song of Solomon. If you think if you have a King James Bible, it was called Song of Solomon. Um, most modern scholars now call it Song of Songs. And what that means is, actually it means the greatest of songs. Okay? So, you think of it... Um, so, like, if we if we think of it like this, um, Christian, when we when we sing Christian music, we say things like "Lord of Lords, King of Kings." It's you know, it basically is saying 
this is the greatest of these. So if this is a song, this is the greatest song, okay? That's what that means whenever you put those words together, okay? It is traditionally attributed to Solomon. Um, again, it's not, um, it's not spelled out specifically that it's Solomon. You know, even last week when we studied Ecclesiastes, we talked about it was written by the teacher, Kohelet. And, and, and again, I said most likely it was an older man, Solomon. Well, this is one of those most likely, this is Solomon, and most scholars who believe it's Solomon would say this is probably young man Solomon, okay? So you have a younger man who is writing about younger man things? I don't know. We'll, we'll get there. All right, interpretations. Very difficult to interpret. Um, I went, I went through, so back a few weeks ago when I was on quarantine, I worked on all these PowerPoints and I spent more time on this PowerPoint for less material than anything else because it's all over the place, okay? How to interpret this. But it looks to me like there are three interpretations that will help guide us tonight and that kind of give us the best chance to overview this book. And I'm gonna go through those real quick with you. Number one, this book, this book might be a metaphor for God's love for Israel, okay? So when you read the bride and the groom, think about God and Israel. Uh, when you think about the way he talks about um, his lover fond fonding over him, um, the idea of worship, um, that idea of being worship, okay? The next one is for Christians, some Christian scholars have looked at this book as a metaphor for the way Christ loves the church. If you know, uh, if you've ever taken a study on Revelation, you know that one of the images that's used a lot in that book is that we are the bride of Christ, right? That Christ is the bridegroom and we are the bride. And so you have this joining, this, 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 this um, celestial uh, holy union that forms. And so some scholars look at this text and see... Uh, Christ's love for the church. So this uh, audacious, large love, great love for the church. And then the third one, maybe the most uh, eh, just matter of fact, this could just be a love letter, an adolescent love letter. Um, I'll be honest, when we were younger, we all said some things differently. And when you were trying to woo your, your partner or someone that you thought you might want to date or, or be with, you said all kinds of stuff, right? Um, this is, uh, again, it, it, it's not the most spiritual understanding of this text, but I think it does lend itself because some of the stuff, man, some of the stuff you're like, okay, how is that God's love for Israel? That's weird. I mean, we're going to talk about the fawns here in a minute, and we aren't talking about deer. Okay, so um, let's just call that what it is. So this is um, so this book again. These three are going to be the way we're going to look at it uh, to at least give us a chance to look at it. The reason it's wisdom literature, <clears throat> excuse me. The reason it's wisdom literature is that it does. It does talk about the value of love and, and, and the importance of the value of love. And in some respects, it talks about, for, for me anyway, the wisdom of love. Why is love so important? How can love be so deep? And if love is so deep and rich, what does that do for the, the, the persons or the entities involved? Okay. So we're going to look at that a little bit. Any thoughts or questions? Before we start reading, any initial comments, anything that when you were reading it, you went, huh, that you'd like to talk about for just a second? Any initial conversations about the, the text? Is I had a question about why it's in the Bible, but with those three, <laughs> those three ideas, I see what, where it might be going. But I, I just thought, I wonder why they put that in there in the first place, you know? Yeah, um, <laughs> um, I, this is so. It's always weird to end 
a Bible study on the um, on one of those that you're like, well, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> um, it, it is it is strange. But let me ask you just to think about that for a second. If if you had to answer that for yourself, if you had to give it an answer, Sue, what would you say? What if you if 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 somebody asked you? Sue, why do you think that Song of Songs is in the Bible? What what might you say? Sue, you're you're muted. Oh, she's muted. Sue, Sue, you're muted. Go ahead and unmute. I haven't gotten used to That's this. That's okay. You're doing fine. You're doing fine. Start that okay. over again. So, so I said the metaphor for God's love for Israel is probably the, the right answer. But I think that for me, it stands for like Christ's love for the church. Okay. Okay. I ex I'm sure that three would also be appropriate, but <laughs> I think it's deeper than that. Yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that. Anybody else? Anybody else that, that might have read the book? Did you have a, a, a question, interpretation? You know, I, uh, I think it's more Christ's love for the church is what, what I, where I came from on that too. So, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. yeah. So. And I will say, how many of you, um, how many of you use the study Bible? Anybody use NIV study? Yeah, we do. Famous one. We if do. you use the NIV study Bible, a lot of the commentary in there leans towards that one for sure. Mm -hmm. It definitely has a bend uh, towards Christ's love for the church, looking at it as a almost like a parable, an extended parable, um, an extended poem about uh, Christ's love for the church. Anybody else? Sometimes it, sometimes it seemed to me like it's it's telling a story and some of it's the recounting of the whole love affair with Israel, maybe, or and going maybe into prophecy when he returns and things like Good. that. Yeah, yeah. Um, in fact, I, I didn't include that one, but there there is some uh, There are some scholars who think there's a prophetic um, thing here, especially if you read it in light of Revelation, bride and bridegroom stuff. Yeah. If you're really into that, if that's something that's really in the forefront of your mind, I think you can read that back in here. Yeah. Good pickup. Doug, I saw you leaning in. Were you wanting to say something? You're muted. Go ahead and unmute. I don't think I can unmute you. Doug, I can't hear you, man. Okay, all right. We'll see if you can get unmuted here in a moment. I can't. Uh, I can't unmute you. I tried, but I don't think I can. I can ask you to unmute, but I can't get you unmuted. Um, so we'll just go from there. Anyway, so okay, I don't want you to see that yet, but whoa. Okay, let's read chapter one, and I'm going to read it. Um, start at chapter one, verse one, and. Um, yeah, so I invite you to listen to this. What does that say, that first word? Draw? Uh, draw me, uh-huh, yeah. Draw me, we will run after thee. Yeah, okay, here we go, verse one. Solomon's Song of Songs. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. For your love is more delightful than wine. Pleasing is the fragrance of your perfumes. Your name is like perfume poured out. No wonder the maidens love you. Take me away with you. Let us hurry. Let the king bring me into his chambers. We rejoice and delight in you. We will praise your love more than even wine. How right they are to adore you. Dark am I, yet lovely. 
O daughters of Jerusalem, dark like the tents of Kedar, like the tent curtains of Solomon. Do not stare at me because I'm dark, because I am darkened by the sun. My mother's sons were angry with me and made me take care of the vineyard. My own vineyard I have neglected. Tell me, you whom I love, where you graze your flock and where you rest your sheep at midday. Why should I be like a veiled woman beside the flocks of your friends? If you do not know, most beautiful of women, follow the tracks of the sheep and graze their young goats and by the tents of the shepherds. I liken you, my darling, to a mare harnessed to one of the chariots of Pharaoh. Your cheeks are beautiful with earrings, your neck with strings of jewels. We will make you earrings of gold studded with silver. While the king was at his table, my perfume spread its fragrance. My lover is to me a sachet of myrrh resting between my breasts. My lover is to me a cluster of henna blossoms from the vineyards of Engedi. How beautiful you are, my darling. Oh, how beautiful your eyes are doves. How handsome you are, my lover. Oh, how charming. And our bed is verdant. The beams of our house are cedars. Our rafters are firs. Whoa. Um, yeah. yeah. Oh, by the way, um, what is it? Um, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Um, <laughs> So let me just ask you, um, read this and study this in Bible study. <laughs> well, we can if it has that intention. <laughs> yeah. And so, 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 so speak to that. If it doesn't have that intention, what, what are you thinking when you hear all those words? Clearly two people speaking to one another and speaking very, uh, cordially very uh very much wooing one another what what are you very much here? over the over the hill i mean over the top over the top yeah 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 where where would you think you might see if you were to think about where you hear or see things like this where would that be things like this yeah hmm i mean if i had read that and you didn't know it was from the bible where would you think that was from the Tennessee Williams play. <laughs> yes. 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 I might even think like a soap opera, like a script for a soap opera. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty graphic. I mean, it doesn't mix a whole lot of words, does it? Um. So let's look at that. Let's look at just that first chapter, but let's think of it from those from those lenses. Um, oops, oops, let me go back. From those lenses, let's think about that first chapter through these lenses. If you interpret what you just heard as God's love for Israel, how do you? How could you? How could you interpret this text in light of that? What would you say? What are some ways you would connect to them? Well, one figure's the king. I mean, okay. one of the characters so, is a king. So, yeah, so clearly one of the figures is a king. Yeah, yeah. And it seems like the king is a masculine person and the his his lover his it seems like his his friend who eventually is probably going to be his his wife the bride okay yeah so you would you would you might be able to link it there what are some other things you see is this so so let's go back to the question I asked I started with at the very beginning kind of mentioned was is this optimistic or pessimistic in view optimistic very optimistic um why, why do you think it's optimistic why would you say that 
Well, it's because it's it's you know effusive uh, praise, really. It is. It's great praise, uh huh. And and that praise goes both ways, doesn't it? When she starts to talk, it does. Yes. <laughs> yes. What do you think? Let me ask you this: What do you think? If you had to define their relationship, what would what would be some of the things, some of the words you would use to define their relationship? Enthralled. Enthralled. Yeah. Don't everybody talk at once. Um. <laughs> Nobody wants to say what they're thinking. <laughs> it's okay. You can say what you're thinking. No need to be embarrassed. There's a lot of fragrance and perfumes and yes, those yes, kinds and, of and things. yes. And there are some scholars who look at that as if you remember the Old Testament in the temple, you did sacrifices and they were ple the smell was pleasing to God. Mm -hmm. Remember that? Mm -hmm. And so you do have some of those those commentaries that come up. Is, is that the reason why they uh, burn some incense in some? <laughs> um, there, there, is a, there, there is a historical precedent for that, yeah. And there's also a scripture that refers to huh? us that, uh, as a fragrance to Christ. Yep, there is. Yeah, you're kind of going to Christ's love for the church, because that's exactly right. Yeah. Oops, we lost Doug and Sarah. Let me ask you this. I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a word, and I want you to think about this passage in light of this word, passionate. If I say that this passage is passionate, how would you give me? Tell me if if I, you hear the word passionate, what are some words that you think about when you think about that word? Not just in light of this text, but if I just said. That their relationship is full of passion or passionate. What would you say? Ah. What might you say if something was passionate? They really care about each other. They really care. Yes, yes. I mean, is the opposite of passion would be wishy washy, right? Mm hmm. Let me tell you, I read this text. These two are not, hey, okay, you're all right. <laughs> no. You're a, five. you're a five. No. They're not talking to each other like you're a five. Well, they start out yeah. by covering, yeah, they start out by covering you with kisses. Yes. I mean, you're a 10. And, oh, but you're a 10. Oh, you're a 10. I mean, we're not. Again, we're not talking about, oh, well, you're, you're all right. You're five. You got pretty eyes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You have a good personality. Um, no, this is a very passionate, um, a very deep. Um, again, uh, I like when you said the word, I think it was so used the word enthralled, mm -hmm. over the top. It is over the top. But, but again, um, think about relationships that, you, you know, with your spouse. They are over the top. There are things that you would say to that person that you would not say to anybody else. Because if you did, we'd be in my office for marital counseling. Um, <laughs> there are words and phrases that you would use just with your spouse. I mean, you know, I think of it like this. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of funny. One of the things that I, I do, obviously, as part of my job is I do a lot of funerals. And one of the neatest part of a funeral is when the family starts telling me the pet names of somebody. So I, I know them as Joe or Jane, right? But when they start meeting with me, it's, it's grandpa or papa or Mimi or mama or, or Lulu or, you know what I mean? And all of a sudden they take on a whole new personality. Especially when you, when, when, I mean, I've done many of, a funeral for a widow or a widower and they tell you, you know, I, my, my spouse used to call me honey bunch or sugar bear or something like that. 
and, and, and but it meant that so much to them because nobody else called them that but the one that they were the closest to. That's deep. That's passionate. And again, if you think about it from the perspective of God's love for Israel, well, this is God's covenantal people, right? They, he loves them. They love him. And that's how, I mean, the whole Old Testament is built upon that relationship, right? Um, and so you, you get this you get this 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 understanding there that the, the love is passionate. And by the way, passionate love is not always rational. Um, the, the, one of the other words you could use is fanatical. Um, fan that fanatical we think of fans like you know like a, fans of a sports team. Have you ever heard a, a real fan of a sports team ever look at their team with, uh, you know, with normal glasses? No. You look at them with rose colored or orange colored or crimson colored or whatever color school or you like, right? You want to see them in the best light, you know? Um, I mean, obviously in Oklahoma next week, we're going to all have fun with Bedlam again. And let me tell you, everyone's going to be making score predictions. And if you're if you're a red person, I guarantee you think the Panthers are going to win. If you're an OSU person, an orange person, you're like, OSU's going to win this game. We don't know what's going to happen. But there is that sense because fanatical is not always rational. Above <clears throat> and beyond that. Well, one of the interesting things that we – I think as, as Christian folk is that when I think about Christ's love for the church is that Jesus's love was not always rational, giving all of himself for the church. Um, one of the most famous, one of the most famous parables is where Jesus says, if you got a hundred sheep and you lose one, you leave the 99 and go find the one. Well, my friends in business sense terms, that's dumb. It's not rational. And yet, that's exactly who Jesus is. Well, you're willing to do that if the one means that much to you. When I hear this text, as weird as it sounds, and as, again, as um, daytime TV as it sounds, there's great passion and great zeal and great fanatic, fanaticism between the two parties. And I think that's how you, if you read this text, you can begin to understand why some scholars look at this as God's love for Israel, Christ's love for the church, or like we said, it could be just simple adolescent love. Now, yeah. Maybe, maybe they are at the wedding reception and they're in a hurry to get to the King's Chambers to consummate their marriage. Uh, if you read chapter two, um, yeah, chapter two, three, four, we get into that, which we're not going to read for this Bible course. Okay. Um, yeah, we're not going to read it today. Um, now, I hope you did read it, but uh, yeah, we're not going to read that. Uh, it, gets, it gets even further, okay? Um, I mean, if you if you if you read read the next chapter two, three, four, five, you 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 see this this relationship continue to bud, and yes, there's a sense of consummation to it, which again, bride and bridegroom that 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 imagery comes comes forth, you know, um, that you know that that old term about consummating the marriage, right? It's not really a marriage until it's consummated. Now now again. For, for those that would be reading this during Solomon's time or even after, up to I mean, certainly through Jesus' time, you remember that uh, marriages were arranged. And, and when they were arranged, you could be betrothed. Remember, the, we're getting close to Christmas, right? So you know the, the story of Mary and Joseph. They were betrothed, which means they were kind of married, but because they hadn't consummated the marriage, they really weren't quite fully married yet. And and so you 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 have this uh, 
strange relationship. But once they have had relations, then then they're really married. They're really joined. And so some of the stuff coming up in the Song of Songs, especially in the uh, chapters four, three, four, and five, is deals with, you know, I, I mean, for lack of a better word, the consummation of the marriage. And, and, and again, you know, scholars throughout history have tried to figure this out. But, but the reality is the consummation of the marriage is the ultimate moment of intimacy. Now, yes, intimacy can include erotic and all that, the eros part of, of love. Um, and, and, and that's for another time. But intimacy also includes that you can't, you're so intimate with someone that, that you can't be any closer. You become one. Remember um, when marriage was, was, was talked about, uh, man and, and woman will leave their parents and join together and become one flesh. They'll be so joined that you can't tell them apart. You know, we even end most marriage. I mean, even this day, we end marriage ceremonies with, you know, what God has put together, let no man or no one put asunder, right? Because we believe you become one flesh. You don't get any closer than that, right? That is ultimate intimacy to be that close to one another. Well, think about it from the perspective of God loving Israel or Christ loving the church. That holds, doesn't it? That idea of intimacy truly holds. God and Israel struggle and, and, and are one. Um, it, it's, a, it's a powerful, but a powerful way to look at the relationship between God and Israel. Same thing with Christ and the church. Now, we have other images that come in, of course. You know, Christ is the head of the church, the head of the body, that sort of thing. But the idea being that if he is the bridegroom and we are the bride, that when we come together, that ultimate moment of intimacy, then we become, we become one. Well, right or wrong, folks, this is the PG-13 part of this, right or wrong, the best way to describe that, the way they describe it in this book. <laughs> Um, but that's that, that that's part of that's part of, of of why this book might be in there because there's no better way to describe intimacy and passion and oneness and and oh. the depths of what you would be willing to do for your partner than 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 love in all of its forms in this case erotic love. Now, when we, so so that again, that kind of is what we would read if we read each line. But like we've read the book, we're not going to read each line. Just kind of give you an overview. But now, if you um, if you know a lot about this book, then what you probably know is Song is Song of Songs eight six through seven. It's probably the most famous part of uh, this book. And so uh, what I'm going to ask you to do is somebody read verses six and seven, please. Somebody read for us. Chapter eight, verses six, and six through seven. Okay. Place me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm. For love is as strong as death, its jealousy unyielding as the grave. It burns like blazing fire, like a mighty flame. Many waters cannot quench love, rivers cannot sweep it away. If one were to give all the wealth of one's house for love, it would be utterly scorned. Okay, you might have heard this. Um, it sometimes shows up in our wedding, at a wedding. 
It also shows up, um, quite frankly, in a lot of premarital counseling sessions. It shows up in marital counseling sessions because in a lot of ways, these, these two verses sum up marital love in really three proverbs. Okay. And, 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 and again, if you are familiar with this book at all, it's probably from here. Okay. So the first one, love is as strong as death. It's jealousy unyielding as the grave. All right. In terms of marriage, marital love, tell me what you see in that first statement. How, how does that, what does that statement have to say? Number one, what does it have to say about marital love? It's a part of about till death do us part. Till death do us part. Yes. Yeah. How long is that, by the way? That's a long time. Right? Oh, man, it's forever, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yes. We believe that we'll be together even, even, even after death. Yes. What else? What else do you see? And this might be one of those times when just look at the words. What word or words in that phrase that's on the screen now, what word or words jump off at you? Jealousy that's unyielding. Jealousy that's unyielding. Wow. What do you hear when you, when you, when you, why did you pick that? Well, I don't know why I picked it, <laughs> but it, you know, it talks a lot about how that we have a jealous God in the Old Testament. Yes, God wants us to be his and his alone, and he wants us to worship him, him alone. Remember old commandment number one. Remember, this is a wisdom piece, so go back to your commandments, right? Old commandment number one, thou shalt have no other gods before me. And how, how far does this jealousy go? To the grave. To the grave. Yielding. It's unyielding. But what else do you see? Well, when it says love is as strong as death, that reminds me that God so loved the world that he gave his only son for us. Interesting. Interesting pickup. That is one of the things why, you know, Christ loves the church. That's one of the reasons we interpret that is because of that verse. Very much so. Yeah. 100%. Going back to, to verse six, something about this picture of the seal touches me that's that's like a a promise a surety a guarantee mm -hmm. it the bible talks about the lord sealing us yes very much so very much so no you're 100 percent correct good good pickup there are two words though that go together do you see the two words that go together? Can you see my cursor on the screen running around? Yes. Yeah. So this one and this one. Death and grave. Yeah. Death and grave. What are, what are the uh, only things in life that are guaranteed? <laughs> death, death and taxes. taxes. Death and taxes. Yeah, death and taxes. Mm -hmm. Death and the grave. Are symbols of the inevitable. <clears throat> You're not going to cheat death. The, you know, I said it a couple Sundays ago on um, All Saints Day. Someday somebody will read my name at an All Saints Day service. It is inevitable. Now, when will that be? I don't know. Hopefully not for a long time. But that's that is reality. You see, death and grave here serve as an idea of reality. This is going to happen because this is inevitable. Love is inevitable. It is that strong that it is there regardless. You can try to cheat love. You can try to cheat death, but you can't avoid it. See how that works? This is a pretty powerful statement. Love is as strong as death. It's jealousy unyielding as the grave. The reality is marital love is so strong that it cannot, 
can't be broken. Now think about that in terms of God's love for Israel, Christ's love for the church. Mm-hmm. The word covenant starts to show up in there. Mm-hmm. Um, covenant is a big word, obviously. Covenant um, drives the Old Testament. You know, the Noahic covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, the David co- Davidic covenant, all the way through the covenant of new life, right? This covenantal language, well, isn't it interesting? If you were to come to my office and say, hey, I want to get married. And I say, okay, let's do premarital counseling. And about three sessions in, we go, hey, let's look at the service. And I hand you the service. Do you know what it says at the top? The covenant of marriage. (laughs) A service for the covenant of marriage. This is covenantal language. God's love for Israel is covenantal language. Christ's love for the church is covenantal language. Very, very powerful stuff. Adolescent love may not be covenant. Excuse me? Adolescent love, however, may not be covenant. covenant. I can't say Uh, covenant. Because it's, you know, it's uh, jumps around. It's skittish. I can't think of the word, but. Well, I mean, again, if it's Solomon, he had like 300 wives and 900 concubines. Like these other two. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right, let's look at the next one. Love burns like a blazing fire, like a mighty flame. All right, when you see that, how does that, how would you describe marital love based on that one? Oh, come on. You can say it. We're all adults here. Moved is into a blazing the desert. fire. Is a blazing fire something big, ferocious, or is it wimpy? <laughs> it's ferocious. It's 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 beautiful, big, right? It 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 it, it it's, it's deep. Um, back to passionate. Yes. Yes, a blazing fire is not a match. A blazing fire is not a candle in a little candle holder. A blazing fire is a dadgum inferno. What do infernos do? They consume you. They consume you. They engulf you. Yes. Love engulfing. Love is all consuming. By the way, in the in some of the Psalms, we talk about God being a consuming fire. Same same principle, like a mighty flame. Mighty flames can do two things, can't they? Sometimes they can be destructive, can't they? They can. But mighty flames also, for I mean, think of from our world, they send people to the moon. It just depends on how that flame works, right? <laughs> depends on, the, on, on that flame. Well, marital love burns like a blazing fire, like a mighty flame. It is raw. It is powerful. Imagine how many movies or TV shows or even cartoons that you've seen where people look at, like, you know, caveman sees fire for the first time, right? Oh, you know? does this think of all the fire images in scripture burning bush um even to jesus peter's warming his hands over the fire jesus cooking over the charcoal fire and each and every time you see this image you be, you know it, it recreates the importance of that basic element well here that basic element is all engulfing all consuming well Marital love should be that. Again, it is two people becoming one flesh. As you said, Doug, to death do us part, right? Richer for poorer, better or worse. I would try to cover all the bases, by the way, in those vows. Because it is all consuming. It is all engulfing. Let's look at the third one. 
Many waters cannot quench love. Rivers cannot wash it away. All right. Talk to me about that one. Well, it's like love. Love is strong and everlasting. Love is strong and everlasting. Yeah. Because what do waters do? I mean, like if you're, okay, so I've got my water bottle. I'm parched. What, did, what have I just done? I took a drink. What did I do that for? Quench, you're thirsty. My, quench my thirst, quench. right? Mm -hmm. Now I am not thirsty anymore. I had a drink, right? My mouth was dry. I got a little water or this is a little pink lemonade from a little packet. But now my thirst is quenched. Think about how put it together. Blazing fire, many waters can't quench that. In other words, there are going to be things they're going to try to. One of the one of the interesting things, and I, I will tell you this because again, in a lot of premarital counseling texts and a lot of marital counseling texts, we talk about this one because <coughs> There are a lot of waters that want to quench your love. If you use that as a metaphor for, you know, other things. There are many things that try to wash away, erode your love. Rivers cannot wash it away. Think about erosion, right? If you, if you go to the, to the creek bank that you went to 20 years ago, it will look different because of erosion, right? The river and the creek just keeps meandering, but eventually it takes off a little bit and a little bit and a little bit. Now, of course, we know this most famously when we look at things like the Grand Canyon. I mean, how many, you know, thousands, millions of years did it take for the Colorado River to, to do that? But it's still doing it, by the way. That's one of the things that it's hard to, it's hard to comprehend is it's still doing it, <laughs> even now. Okay. And, and, and yet, love, true marital love, can't be washed away it cannot be quenched in other words it cannot be extinguished one of the most beautiful i, I will say this most beautiful things that i see in ministry is watching a couple that's been together it doesn't have to be even a long time could be you know, many, many years or a short time, but watching them hold each other's hands in moments of, of strife and just be able to be the only one that can comfort the other. I sat with a, 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 a mom and a dad once. They're, they're, they, were, they were in their 70s, but their 50-year-old son had a heart condition and, and he died. And I remember going to their house and, 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 you know, we were, I went to go make a visit to talk to them. We were going to start planning the funeral. And I just, I can see them as clear as I'm looking at you now. These, you know, they were both in their seventies, maybe eighties. They were, they were an older couple, but they just held each other's hands and you could just tell it wouldn't have mattered. I mean, I could put my hand on them. I could pray for them. I could, but that, that, there was something about that that was real and it's one of the most beautiful things you know i i, I talk about it all the time you, you 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 know there are days by the way that being a pastor is hard let me just tell you some of them have been lately actually <laughs> uh, because of this pandemic but there is no one who can calm me down like jennifer She'll say something and just like, okay, it's going to be all right. You know what I mean? I, there's just something about that relationship that's different. It's different than the relationship you have with your kids or your grandkids or your church friends or your work friends or your friends' friends. There's just something different about that marital relationship. Especially if you take it seriously. If you take it seriously... The whole, all the vows that we say, man, it is, there's a reason that, you know, we sometimes even quote 
uh, where we say, you know, uh, a cord that has three strands, you, your partner, and God is a cord not easily broken. Um, powerful stuff. But these are probably, again, the most three famous verses that come out of here. You see this a lot, actually. Um, you might even see them. In fact, I know one of these, um, like I think if you go to Hobby Lobby, there's a, one of those wood plaques with it on there. <laughs> I, I want to say it's love burns like a burning flame, like a mighty flame, a fire and flame. But you can see where these images, again, if we interpret them, yes, you can interpret them as adolescent love. And you're right, Sue. Adolescent love is probably not this deep. The marital love is. And so when you think about God's love for Israel or Christ's love for the church, it's not too far a stretch at all to use this kind of language to think about God's love for Israel, God's love for the church, Christ's love for the church. Okay. And that's why this is the wisdom of love, because this is the kind of love that I think that the writer of the Song of Songs is feeling towards that other person. But I think it's when we think about it, looking at this, when I asked you if we should study this book, yes, we should. And we should study it because there is no deeper understanding of love than right here. This is the kind of love that Christ has for the church, that God has for Israel. This is the kind of love that is, is, is almost unfathomable. It's passionate. It's not always rational. It does things that you can't believe because it's so deep and so rich and and is so you it, 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 it's jealous and it can't be put out and it roars and engulfs so that's that's the way again a lot of scholars look at this book um uh, again it's it's not the easiest book to go over but it does have some strange parts to it <laughs> i'm not gonna lie about that but when you really look at some of the imagery and you see it from the point of view of imagery and you think about what it could mean, man, it's actually a very pretty book. Um, a very, a very interesting, a very deep book. Any questions or thoughts on the Song of Songs? All right. Well, I want to, I want to take two minutes and I want to put a bow on this. Um, so over the last nine weeks, we have gone over psalms and we've gone over wisdom literature. Um, very famous stuff. Again, we went, you know, we talked about this from the beginning. If even even people who don't really read the Old Testament have read Psalms and they've read Proverbs, you know, or <coughs> they've heard these things before. Well, my hope was over the over the last nine weeks that that maybe you got a new appreciation for them, a deeper one. I know that you'd already read them. This isn't like an obscure book that, you know, maybe you hadn't read. I know you've read Psalms. I know you'd read Proverbs. And I know you'd read Ecclesiastes, at least the time, to, the time stuff. But my hope is that maybe now you have a deeper appreciation for them, that the Psalms really are words that we speak to God. And wisdom really is the things that we learn from God, you know, knowledge and love. And, and even, even in those moments of pessimism, that idea that, covenantal love will, will eventually win out so i hope as you continue your study i hope this isn't the last time you look at these texts i say that every bible study at the end because i don't ever want this to be the last time you encounter a text i want it to be one time amongst many so that the next time you read psalms or the next time you you pick up the proverbs or ecclesiastes or song of songs that that you'll remember these tools in the toolbox you'll you'll think about how we've looked at this and maybe something new will present itself to you. Um, maybe something more powerful. Maybe something you hadn't seen the first time. And so that is my hope for every Bible study, and especially in this one, where we study again the Psalms, because they, they really are our words to God and wisdom, the things that we learn from God. So any final thoughts, questions, comments? Not about the class, but I'm, I hate to be persistent, but my syllabus says we're meeting on November 18th. Did we skip a week? What happened there? No, we, 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 adjust, we had to adjust the, the calendar. Uh, okay. This is, no, this is it. Yeah. All right. No, you're fine. You're fine. You were right. We moved it. We moved a couple of weeks and this is, no, this is where we um, ended up. Ended up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
because we didn't take the week off that we were going to. So mm -hmm. anything else? Just a comment. I uh, 20 something years ago when my son was engaged and, and, and they were doing their premarital counseling, he said something about Song of Solomon. <clears throat> and I said something about the spiritual aspects. And he says, Mom, it's just about the other stuff. And I'm just wondering, <laughs> probably in, in that kind of counseling, they, they really don't delve into the other layers as much, maybe I'm thinking. Um, no, not necessarily. I mean, again, <laughs> this is a text that I would say, is it, about, is it about God's love for Israel? Yes. Is it about Christ's love for the church? Yes. Is it about adolescent love? Yes. Probably, yeah. I think it can be all. You know what I mean? I, I think it can be a both and here. Um, but then again, good stories always are, right? We tell stories about things we know to talk about things that we don't know. And and I, I wonder if, if if in some ways this is a book about two lovers talking about adolescent love. But when we understand the depth of love that it talks about, the wisdom that we gain is that wisdom of the love of God for the for Israel or Christ's love for the church. Anything else? Well, I want to thank you all um, for participating. Um, this is the first time we've done an entire study, nine weeks on um, online. Uh, it's been an adventure. We've learned a lot together. Uh, there's things that we've gotten better at as we've gone along, and I appreciate your, your willingness to do this. Um, again, uh, this will all be posted to YouTube, and, and the good thing about being able to do it this way is that uh, these Bible studies will now be on our YouTube channel, and people can pick them up anytime. Uh, in fact, we're trying to build our content on our YouTube page. If you've not gone there, I really highly really, really want you to try to go look up our YouTube page. Um, just put in Elk City United Methodist Church and it will come up. Subscribe to that channel. Um, all of Ben's, Pastor Ben's uh, series on uh, uh, prophets is in there. Uh, his, his stuff on John is now showing up there. All of these Bible studies are there. And now we have all the impact videos that we ran a couple of weeks ago. They're all on there. And all the videos that we're creating for Advent will be on there. Um, because that's what we're filming right now is uh, Advent stuff. So uh, getting ready for that season. So, um, but, but please check the YouTube channel and uh, that's going to be where a lot of this is going to show up uh, because we're going to record things on either Zoom or Facebook and then place them there. So again, thank you guys. It's been a blast. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the study. I hope it's been uh, edifying to you. I hope you learned something and um, we'll probably, we will do something again in the spring. Uh, Pastor Ben and I both will. So like I said, we're not quite a quite yet to uh to to announce that so all right well i'm gonna do this let's uh, let's have a word of prayer and then let's uh let's shut her down let's pray gracious god thank you so much for this group of people who have gathered for nine weeks now to study the psalms and study the wisdom literature god it is a powerful material it's so important god that we study your word and because your word is powerful it speaks to our heart it speaks to our mind and it truly does guide our soul so god uh, tonight, we just ask that all that we've studied together and all the time we've spent together, that uh, you've used it to write your words on our heart so that ultimately, God, we live them with our lives. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you all very, very much. I'm going to stop the recording.